Let's do this. Let's gather up here. I'm excited to share on Father's Day. I'm always excited to share on Father's Day. It's one of my favorite days of the year. I see the barbecue rolling in here, so we don't want to mess around. Get that. We don't want the brisket to get cold. Um, why don't I pray as we get started this morning? God, uh, we thank you that you've given us yet another opportunity to get together this morning. Lord, to hear from you, to hear what you have to say to us. Specifically, Lord, this morning, uh, as dads, we want to hear from you. We want to be encouraged. We want to be strengthened for the purpose for which you've created us, O oh God. Um, I pray that everything that takes place today, Lord, would, would leave men, leave dads specifically inspired to continue to thrive, to live out every intention for their lives, O oh God. Lord, you're going to speak to each of us individually, God, whether we're men and dads, oh God, and you're going to speak to about our, our role in fulfilling your purpose in the world. We thank you so much, God, for this opportunity to get together, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I am excited, guys. Um, before I share this morning, I always feel like I need to do this and I need to say this. It's kind of my man day pre-game instructions, if you will. First of all, I want you to know, no matter how I might come across, the intention of my heart on Man Day, on Father's Day, is always to be an encouragement. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, i got to tell you, we as men and as dads take a beating year-round. Um, and it starts with us. We beat ourselves up quite a bit in terms of our inadequacies and shortcomings, or I wish I would have, or this is what I've done, or this is what I've said. So I need you to know that for me, my heart this morning is just to be an encouragement to you. And to say that I'm just like you, I am not a perfect dad, and I am way far from a perfect dad. I feel like I'm a warrior with you, striving to see God's plan lived out in my kids' lives and in my family's lives. So just know, everything that I say today is meant to be life-giving and encouraging, and I do want you to leave inspired. I really do. I want you to leave one, to get right back at it, living out God's purpose uh, for your life. I also want to say this, kind of a pre-game instruction. The things that I say today are meant to speak to something that I believe that God is for and not against. Now, it's sad that I have to say that, but I feel like I need to say that. Sometimes when you're for something and you're passionate about something, uh, people interpret that as you're against something or you're opposed to something. We live in a culture now that if you want to elevate a cause or an individual, you almost feel like you have to tear something else down first to make that happen. And, and let me say more specifically what I'm trying to get at here this morning. Obviously, it's Man Day. It's Father's Day. And we're speaking directly to dads. And we're speaking to men. Um, speaking about God's purpose in your life. And there's unique things that God has given to men that he has not given to women. And some things that he's given to men, women can do as well. Right? That's just the way it is. And so when I say God is doing this in men's life, or you're a purposeful, or you matter, or you're the only one that can do X, Y, and Z, I don't want anybody to interpret like, well, if I'm a woman, then I'm not important. That's farthest from the truth that, I, that that's as far from the truth as, as God's word, okay? It really is. God's word does everything to elevate women, and this is the thing I would say about that. Jesus did more for women in his lifetime, in that culture, and in that day than any man you could ever imagine, to stand up for women and to defend them and to give them rights, and I wholeheartedly believe in that. But this morning... I'm speaking to dads, okay? I'm wanting to encourage them. And I think that all of us, if we're not dads this morning, we can rally around dads. Because I got to tell you, being a dad is a fight. Am I right? It's a battle. Every day, you want something so desperate. I'm, I'm off my notes already. You want something so desperately to happen in the life of your family. And you need more encouragement. And you need more inspiration. And you need more people coming along your side saying, you're doing a great job. Just keep going, man. I believe in you. I support you and what God's calling you to do, even though you might think, oh, man, I need to tell him he's doing this wrong, this wrong. That may be true, but I got to tell you, we need to hear that encouragement and that support uh, this morning. This morning, what I want to do is really share openly and honestly as a uh, really coming from a perspective of a father, of a dad of six, but I'm also coming from the perspective of what I call a fatherless son. As you guys know, my dad was shot and killed when I was seven. I'm not going to rehash that story. Other than to say, I really understand the perspective of a father, both from being a dad of six, but also a son that didn't have a father, longing for a father to be in my life. Those are things that are critical, and I feel like there's a truth that I've learned in, 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 in being a dad and a fatherless son that I just want to share. And i got to tell you, 
the older I get and the older my kids get, this truth that I believe and that I'm convinced about uh, just gets more and more real as time goes by, as I watch my kids grow old. And this is, this is the simple truth. I say this every year, okay? And I'm going to say this, but I'm going to explain it as we go along. This is the truth. Dads matter. I like to keep it simple. Guys, I know how this is. I'm not going to make this a big theological thing. When you leave, here's what I want you to remember that God thinks. Dads matter, okay? And that's what I want to talk to you this morning. You know, it's like I said just a few minutes ago. Um, I think as dads, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about myself, I think a lot of times we feel insignificant or that we don't matter. Let me just say that. That we mess up, that we're doing all this kind of stuff. Um, we look in the world, and I really think the world just takes, takes a, just beats down on dads. It's just, just my perspective, the way I view it, the way I view TV series. I say it every year. The media just, just really does a, a job of making you feel pretty small and insignificant. I think a lot of the times our spouses, I'm not, definitely not speaking about my wife this morning. i got to be honest about that. But I think sometimes our spouses can make us feel insignificant as well. And that we're only as good as what they need us to do versus our role as a dad and, and leading our children and that sort of thing. Uh, I think sometimes our kids can make us feel like we don't matter. Is that true? If I said some of the things that my kids have said or done to me, I'd be like, yeah, wow, I feel loved today. Especially as my kids get older and more mouthy, it's like tough. Amen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sometimes I go to bed and I talk to Jamie, and, and Jamie will authenticate this. I'm like, man, I'm just a terrible dad. I'm failing. Look, I can't believe my kids are doing this or saying this or treating this way. What have I done? What should I have done? You know, okay? Is that authentic already this morning? So sometimes we look at our own kids and think, man, they're not even honoring me. Like, that's the craziest thing. I feel like, have I not done enough to be honored? Like, not that you're seeking it. See, I'm preaching now. <laughs> Being authentic with you. I got to tell you, here's what I've discovered. Experience as a dad and a fatherless son. I mean, I had a father, you understand. Uh, but a fatherless son, I've realized that absolutely that dads matter. But this is what I see in our culture. I see, I've seen it in my life. I see it in my kids. And I see it in our culture. And it's this thing called a father hunger. Okay? It's what I call a father hunger. Let me explain what I mean by that. A father hunger is a God-designed craving for dad's presence in our lives. I am absolutely convinced that there is an, an, I can't even describe it, what the right word, there is a huge father craving in the heart of every single human being in the world. And when I say craving, what I mean, there is a depth of longing. Almost, you can't really explain it. It's like this natural inclination and bent that's in your heart uh, where you long and you have this unquenchable desire to need your dad. And I almost can't qualify what that need is, but every child expresses it differently. I need dad, and it looks like this, and this is what I need from him. And yeah, mom's giving it to me, but I need it from my dad. This is something that I've personally experienced and that I see all around us. I see this father hunger in so many different ways. It manifests so clearly. For example, let me, let me kind of give you this perspective. How many times have you seen a child whose father, for all intents and purposes, is abusive and has abandoned, is either physically absent, emotionally absent, and you look in from the outside and you think to yourself, my gosh, that child's having a tough life. That's just a tough dad to deal with. He's a hard dad. That's a difficult dad. And you think, man, that child should run, you know, run away a tail out of there. But there's always the hunger in that child's heart to have connection with that dad. Even though, for all intents and purposes at that moment, that father is not giving anything to their child that's life-giving. Does that make sense? I see children that are abused and have bad home lives, and they're almost apologizing for themselves just so they might have a morsel of their dad's attention, making excuses for why their dads are doing the things that they do, blaming themselves, tolerating the things that they go through. And you see it in those lives, but you also see it in our society. I mean, I could have spent all day this morning, and you don't want me to do that, going through statistics, right, talking about the absence of father from homes, the result of absence of fathers from homes, crime, prison rates, destructive behaviors, 
bad choices that we would call them. And you would say it's all a result. And statistics show there's a correlation. How about that? Between this rise in prison rates, this rise in crime, this rise in brokenness and bad behavior. And when you look, statistically, dad's not in the home. To me, it's crystal clear. There's something that dad provides that no one else can provide. No one can replace what a dad offers and is able to give to a child. And you see that because where there's absence, again, of fathers, there's a gaping hole and a void and a brokenness there exists. I think without even getting to the word of God yet, and I'm about to, I made the statement that dads matter. I think you, we, need, we all believe this is true. Fathers have a unique, irreplaceable, and indescribable bond with their children. A bond that has the power to produce life. I love this word indescribable because it's almost like I said earlier, you can't communicate the type of hunger that's in your heart for your dad. I need dad. There's something natural. Nobody, let's put it this way, nobody had to teach a child at any point in their life, you need dad. Is that right? Nobody said, hey, did you know you need dad in your life? There is this longing to be physically with him, to hear from him, and so on and so forth. And you know what? When I think about that statistically and from the world's perspective, that truth that we can all agree on, it makes sense because this is the way that God designed it to be. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to stay there just briefly, okay? Genesis chapter 1. You can also download our Common Ground Church app. There's some notes in there. You can fill them in and kind of track with me. But there's some powerful verses. I shared this last year, and I think it's important that I share it uh, again this year. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it said, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Man, I could spend all day talking about this. This is a loaded set of verses. And we could talk about what does it look like to be made in the image and the likeness of God and how does that express itself and what about this whole idea of creation. But we're not, we're not going to get into that this morning. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to call it man day theology. You know what that is? Say it and move on. I'm not going to go deep in this, but I'm just going to say a few things that I think will help us understand what I mean that dads matter. Number one, what we see from the word of God is that God purposefully chose to create us uniquely as men and women. No question about it. It was God's desire and God's intention to make a man and a woman different. Now, we can't just, that's just the way it is. Now, we could talk about the differences, physical differences. I don't talk about that. Emotional differences, practical differences, the way personalities express themselves. There's no question. My wife and I are like, you know, there's a book out there, one's from Venus, one's from Mars. Like, yeah, it's like, why are you even thinking that way? Like, I have blue lenses, she has pink lenses. We're looking at the same thing. We're on different opposite sides of the earth on, the, on that thing. There's no question that God did that. Here's the question we have to answer, though. Why? God could have done anything. He could have said, I'm just going to make this thing, a human. Now, it's one, and it has everything it needs in one, and it's just going to function and do whatever. So why? And what I got to thinking about, there's nothing random or arbitrary or just by chance or from the hip that God has ever done. God doesn't do anything by accident. God does everything with a purpose. And here's what I believe. I believe that God, based on the word of God, God created a man and a woman different because he would create them to need each other. That is, there would be a void in each of us that could not be satisfied alone. But that when we came together, and this is true broadly of relationships, okay? There's nothing in and of ourselves that is complete where we say, I don't need anybody. People say that. But the truth is, as humans, we need other people. I mean, science has proven this. Psychologists have proven You need touch, for example. You need people in your life. You need to have conversations or you're not a healthy person. So when you think about God's intention then, he created a man and a woman to come together in marriage that there would be a need that would be met and satisfied in each other. But on a bigger picture, what I think God is doing is he created us to need relationships and that through relationships, God's ultimate purpose is realized. And in my opinion, 
based on the word of God, his ultimate purpose is to make life happen. Now, what do I mean by that? Not just our phrase, but when you think in Genesis, God is a creative being. He created this earth, put some stuff in it, sent people into it, and he takes joy and pleasure saying, go make something of this. Make life happen, both physically in children, physically with the material that I've given you. Express yourself, and God takes great joy in that. Do you understand? So God is a life maker, but he's also making life by redeeming the areas that are affected by sin and the brokenness in our life. So as individuals, we are life makers, but here's the deal. Our capacity to experience the fullness of God's life cannot be realized without other people in our life, on a broad statement. But biblically, in relationship between a man and a woman, when you come together, you come, the pieces of the puzzle come together, and you begin to experience all that God, all that God has for you. So number one, God created us different. Number two, God wanted us to be unique so we would uniquely convey life to other people. All I'm going to say to that is that men live and function personality-wise different than women. And so therefore, naturally, they're going to convey life differently in the world. That should just be obvious. But I'm going to take it a step further. When you look in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2, God had an intention he had a desire. He gave the freedom to do this. He blessed humans and said, you can come together and have these things called babies. How crazy is that? You can have these babies. And so through that, there's something else that God intended. And this is what I want to say. Number three, God designed us then as dads to form a unique, unbreakable relational bond with our children where we would convey life to them. Let me explain it. As a dad, nobody had to tell me when I first saw a baby, my baby, or my kids, oh, you need to love that thing. I was like, I love this thing. I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I love this thing. And why is that poop black? And why is that belly, yeah, I can go on and on. Like, what's going on here? But I love it, still the same. Nobody had to tell me. There was a natural bond. I'm like, if anybody touches this baby, someone's going to get hurt in this hospital. Like when Sal was born, he had breathing issues, and he was put in the NICU. You don't think I lived in the NICU? Like every time somebody came up, why are you touching him? Why are you doing that scan? Why are you putting that in his mouth? Why is his back? Why is he breathing like that? Aren't you going to do something about that? Like all of a sudden, this natural, like, I need you in my life. I want you in my life, and I want to give you something. I want to give you myself. That happens. There's this bond, and guess what? I noticed this crazy thing. This baby grew up and wants to be around me. Why? I have no idea. I want to spend time with him. I want to talk with him. I want to hang out with him. I just want to play games. I want to watch TV. I want to play Minecraft. I want to play all these crazy things. Or board games. You know, they want to be with me. That's crazy. Now, who taught them to do that? See, God's design is released when you see that. I matter to my sons and my daughters. And nobody taught them. And there's this bond that is absolutely unbreakable. So I want to go back to the statement I made earlier. Where I said, um, fathers have a unique, irreplaceable. I want to say it this way. Fathers have a God designed. From a perspective of a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what we need to understand. God, there's not just this scientific, I don't understand why there's this bond, but it's this. Fathers have a God designed, unique, irreplaceable, and indescribable bond with their children. A bond that has the power to produce life. When I say to you, dads, you matter, what I'm saying is God's word makes that very clear. You can't explain it with words. I don't understand the bond. They can't articulate it, but there's just something. I need dad in my life. I got to tell you, as I was processing this, I mean, this I shared last year too. It's something that really ministers and speaks to me. But as I begin to process this truth, gosh, I matter. I matter to my children. Coming up on Father's Day, I do a lot of reflection. So obviously, you know, I always see everything I'm doing wrong or I'm falling short or I could have done or look how old they're getting. I'm missing my opportunity. Did I miss it? Did I blow it? What the heck just happened here? So that's just my human nature. Jamie does it as a mom. And moms, you do that as well. So I'm processing. I'm, Lord, I just want to be a good dad. And God began to speak to me and remind me again that I mattered. And he showed me something in the word of God for me that I want to convey to you as dads that expresses one unique way where it shows that you matter to your kids' lives. I want to I I share this, this, uh, this verse with you where God was affirming me and building me up as a dad, and I pray it's an encouragement to you. Again, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 3, okay? Or write it down or track with me here this morning. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 
17, there's this verse that for all intents and purposes, if you read it, you would just pass over. It's a great verse, but you don't think twice about it. You know what I mean? It's really not the main emphasis of what you would think when you, when, when you read the Bible. It's not the thing that pops up. But I want to read it because it's so powerful and so meaningful. Um, listen to what it said. It said, Then a voice from heaven said, The Father in heaven spoke and said, This is my Son, whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Let me give you a quick background. Jesus had just come to John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been going out in the community telling people about Jesus. He'd come to save them from their sins. And the way that you express your faith is through the act of baptism. If you come, it's you're, you're saying, I identify with that message. I believe that I need him. And so Jesus comes and says, John, I need to be baptized. And John's like, you don't need to be baptized. You don't have any sin. What's your problem? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, I have to do this because it's the right thing. In essence, what Jesus was saying, I'm validating your message, John. The world needs to understand that what you're preaching and what you're saying about me is true and that it's to be believed. And so Jesus was baptized. But all that aside, as he's coming up out of the water, it says the heavens opened up and the Father spoke out loud these words, Jesus, you're my son. I love you and I am so proud of you. Think about that. I love you. I love this guy, everybody. And I'm proud of Jesus, my son, who is now on the world to see what I know and what I see in him. You know what's so funny is that the common way of understanding this verse, it's almost like it's an expression of strategy. People don't see it. So, for example, here's the way they understand this verse. The reason the Father spoke out of heaven to Jesus was so that other people would hear that Jesus was the approved guy. And that it really was just said as a strategic move so other people would believe who Jesus said he was. Do you understand? That's usually how that's interpreted. Now I will say this. God often did that. God did miracles or signs or spoke. In fact, later in Matthew chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus took up John and Peter and went up to a mountain and he was transfigured. That means he changed before them and his glory, who he really was as God. Began. And they were just overwhelmed. They're like, what the heck's going on here? I see you for who you really are. I'm blown away. There's a whole scenario. And God the Father speaks again and said, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. And then it's followed by, you need to listen to this guy because he's the appointed one. So I understand that God does it. But when I look and I reflect on this, this idea in Matthew chapter 3, where the Father speaks to Jesus and says, I love you and that I'm proud of, proud of you. I think that if we just look at it from the perspective of expressing a strategy, it really fails. It's a false view, if you will, of the relationship that the Father has with the Son. Meaning, are we to think that the Father only said out loud, Jesus, I love you and I'm proud of you because he wanted everybody else to hear? Really had no significance and meaning to Jesus. He didn't need it kind of thing. Does that make sense? Are we to just look at this from this cold theological perspective that, hey, I'm just trying to get something done. You guys need to believe in Jesus. Or is there something for Jesus himself? You know, one of the things I think is hard for us to wrap our mind around is the fact that Jesus is fully human. The Bible says that Jesus is fully human. That is, he has flesh like you and I. He has organs like you and I. He has a human brain. He has limitations of human capacity. And that when he became human, he laid aside his divine rights, his amazingness, if you will, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence and power, all that Jesus didn't get rid of it. He didn't stop being God, but he laid it aside and he allowed himself to be narrowed by human capacity. Now, why does that matter? Well, Jesus was hungry, Jesus was thirsty, Jesus was exhausted, Jesus cried, Jesus was angry, Jesus celebrated like nobody else. Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted in every way, went through everything that you and I went through. In the flesh, he understands and understands the needs that every single human has. So can I ask you a question? Does Jesus have a need for a father? Does he have a, do you have a need for a father? Do you have a hunger to know that you are loved and that you're valuable and that you're significant and that you belong does Jesus need to have a sense of identity? See, we're going to get messed up if we think he didn't need all that. He's God. He knew exactly what was going on. I understand. 
But as a human, he needed to have a sense of who he was, where he was going, and the things that he was going to accomplish in his life. From my perspective, Jesus needed to hear from the Father. He needed to know that the Father loved him and was proud of all the things that we're doing. It's just funny. When I was thinking about this verse, you know when Jesus said, uh, Father said, I love you and I'm proud of you? Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't performed a miracle. He hadn't gathered up massive crowds yet. He didn't even go on a speaking tour yet. Nothing. I'm not proud of you because you're a great son or you got a lot of money or you did a, man, there's some powerful stuff. I just want to tell you, son, that I love you and that I'm proud of you. And we see it, man, I could go on in John 17, this real relationship, this expression of genuine relationship is seen so clearly. And I got to tell you, in my opinion, the Father's voice in Jesus' life had a significant impact on him because Jesus was convinced that his Father loved him. Jesus said this, I want to I read some verses real quick. I want you to think about this for a second. John 3, 35, this is what Jesus said. The father loves the son, therefore he's given, him, given all things into his hand. The father loves the son. Okay, thanks, Jesus. Could Jesus have said, uh, God's given everything to me, everything, all the power and authority is in my hand? Why did he have to say the father loves the son, and therefore he gives him everything? Why did he say in John chapter 5, verse 20, the father loves the son, and shows him all the things that he himself is doing. How about in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18? Now this was spoken in relation to a prophecy in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. When it was describing a yet-to-come human Jesus. Said this, Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one that I love, in whom I have delight. Can I ask you, why not say it this way? Hey, I got a servant. His name is Jesus. He's going to be coming and he's got a job for me. So just do what he says. Why all this emotion? Why all this stuff? Like, I've got a servant. I've chosen him. I love him. And I got to tell you, I take so much pride in this guy. Why? They don't need to fake relationship. They have that relationship. It's clear to me that the father speaking this kind of language to the son was very meaningful and very transformative for Jesus. And Jesus reciprocated that love for the father. And this is what I would say. Being convinced of his father's love, Jesus knew his identity and was able to thrive. You, say, you see, we think Jesus did all the things that he did with his life just because he's God. Okay. We don't have time this morning. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Jesus was as limited as you and I. He needed the Holy Spirit to come upon him to empower him to do every task that God asks us to do. Okay. But there was something powerful, I believe, that Jesus had by knowing and being convinced that the Father loved him. He was able to thrive. So like any son... Or any daughter, how are you able to overcome? How are you able? How was Jesus able to get through the stuff that he got through? Do we understand it wasn't easy for Jesus? Rejection, ridicule, prosecution. I mean, think middle school on steroids. You know what I mean? Everybody's picking on me, knocking me down, taking my books, shoving me in the locker, putting my face in the toilet, not inviting me to the parties. I'm not important. Nobody likes me. I'm fat kid. I'm this. I'm that. All those rages of emotions are going through. Jesus, how does he overcome the persecution, the rejection, the ridicule, the shame, the, the cross, the betrayal of friends? And how does he overcome the night before the cross when he's saying, I don't even want to go to the cross? I mean, I just don't want to do this. Nevertheless, Father, I'll do what you want me to do. It was because he was convinced. I'm going to say this. Jesus thrived. I'm going to say it again. Because he was convinced about his identity. I know who I am. I know where I belong. I know that I matter. I know that I have value, worth, and significance, and no one else can define me. I have a purpose that the Father has given to me. So if everybody comes against me, how does Jesus have the courage and the confidence to stick out his chest and to take on the world and to take on life and to fulfill his purpose if it wasn't for his Father's voice in his life? You tell me. 
if Jesus is really fully human. I'm going to say this. Listen. Knowing he was loved. This is for me, okay? And this is, I'm going to get to, I'm speaking to my own kids. This is what God is speaking to me. Knowing he was loved enabled Jesus to thrive and not chase. That phrase needs to stick in your head. Jesus was able to thrive and not chase. He was in control of his destiny. Nobody else. He wasn't waiting on anybody. He was just moving forward. He didn't need to chase. Let me explain what I mean. When I began to think of what God was showing to me, speaking to me through his word, I began to think about me as a fatherless son. My greatest need growing up was a father to be in my life. And I got to tell you, it was the hardest youth I could ever imagine going through. I don't mean hard that we didn't have money. We didn't have a lot of money. Or I needed shelter or I had this massive sickness or any of that. But I think worse than sickness and all that is just not having a dad in my life to tell me who I am. To have a sense of identity, a sense of belonging. I remember so vividly going through middle school, elementary school, and middle school, and the rage and the battle of just trying to, I wanted to come home when I felt like garbage. And I felt so small, and I felt so insignificant, and I felt like it didn't matter. You understand? Like, I came home and sat on my bed. Now here's the interesting thing. My mom encouraged me. My mom spoke life over me. My mom believed in me. My mom would have done anything. She did do everything for us. Worked her tail off, worked her way out of welfare, did jobs that she didn't want. You guys know the story. I, there's nothing lacking from my mom. Do you understand what I'm getting at here now? But I still sat on my bed and wondered, who am I? And so you know what I did with my life? I chased after my identity while other kids thrived. Do you hear me this morning? These kids are puffing up their chests next to me. They don't care what people say or do to them. They're just grabbing life by the horns, and they're running, and they're living, and they're dreaming. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? Who am I? Where do I fit into this big, old world? And so what I did, I spent my youth chasing, going in circles going to this person and that person, hoping they would tell me who I am, my value, and altering who I was to please them so they would give me what I needed to hear that my father was designed to give me, that I needed to hear from his mouth. And there's a difference. A son or a daughter who knows their identity, their value, and their worth, whose father is just physically present in their life, tends to thrive. But the fatherless son or daughter chases. Chases meaning somebody else controls their destiny and not me controlling my own destiny and living out God's intention for my life. I think every one of us can identify and hear the chase. It is the most consuming thing you will ever go through. It will wear every bit of your emotion out. It will physically drain you. Because your life, if you were to really write it down and pen it out, has become all about the pursuit of finding your identity, your value, and your worth. A sense of belonging. God speaking to me. Sal, if your kids are to thrive and not chase, give them a sense of belonging. Give them a sense of worth. Give them a sense of significance that they matter in this big old world. Ask any one of my kids, maybe not Ellie, she might not be able to vocalize it yet. Listen to me, and I'm reaffirming this in my own life. Three things. What are my three things, kids? Daddy loves you, Daddy's proud of you, and I say, and they finish, I make Daddy happy. And I always followed up, not always, often I followed up with, you know, here's your dreams and you can do this and I believe in you. I end with this again. Dads matter. I matter. I don't care what the world says. I don't care 
what the people in my life say. I don't even care about the lies that I tell myself. That's what I gotta convince myself. I matter. My kids need me and they crave me. I don't have to be a warrior. I don't have to know how to hunt. I don't have to be a big, strong, and mighty man and grow amazing beards during the hockey season. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter if we live in a home. It doesn't matter if we have a car or if I have an inheritance to leave to my kids, as great as that is. My kids would live on the street with me and be the happiest kids in the world. My wife and I joke, we have a house with five bedrooms. I swear to you, one of them gets used. It's ours. We could live in a shoebox and they would thrive. They could be barefoot with no clothes and they would thrive. That's because mom and dad are there. So this morning, dads, I got to tell you one more time. I'm going to tell you every year until you believe it. You matter. I don't care. You matter. You made mistakes, doesn't matter. You got to do better. I do too. You matter. Just start speaking life to your kids. Don't let anybody trick you or deceive you or fool you. This morning, dads, I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you to live out your destiny and your purpose. I bless you to grab hold like a mighty warrior of all that God has entrusted you, a quiver full of kids. And to make that your sole purpose and destiny, to empty yourself in the life of your children, that you will have the courage and the confidence and the strength and the wherewithal to rise with your chest out strong and speak to your life, the life of your children so they will thrive in the name of Jesus and they will not chase after identity and worth, but they will know it and find it in you because you reflect your Father in heaven. God, this morning, let that word be true of us. And what I mean, Lord, is that let that word be believed by us. I mean convinced of that truth that like Jesus thrived, that we would thrive. God, many of us as dads in this room did not have a dad in our life. They were physically absent. They were emotionally absent. They were very present and abusive. And so, Lord, we have this hurdle to overcome. We're carrying this weight of really not getting what it means to be a father. But, Lord, we have an example in you this morning. In the way that you interacted with your own son that we can interact with our sons and daughters, that we can simply speak words of life to them. And to know that just being physically present, rubbing shoulders side by side, we are breathing, breathing, oozing life into our children. God, may you raise up a generation of children that thrive and not chase for your glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Dad.